It is my pleasure to turn over the podium to my friend and colleague, Dr. David Zavea from Texas A&M, who will talk to us about aspects of lymphatic uh, contractility. Thanks, Dan. I'd like to thank the ACP for also inviting me to come and um, prevent an overview. I'm going to give you a, kind of a bird's eye overview of lymphatic physiology, taking it from the point at which Dr. Oxen left off. Once we have lymph formed in the lymph in the lymphatic capillaries, how do you actually move it through this one-way transportation system? And I'm actually going to combine the two sessions that I'm listed for basically into one long session. Hopefully, you'll be able to persevere through it. Okay, we can kind of skip over this, go over this quickly, but basically, I'm going to be starting talking about these vessels over here, the muscularized collecting lymphatics, where you see the investment in the, in the outer wall with a very unique lymphatic muscle cell. Um, all the way from there, basically to the junction of the great veins of the neck, you have lymphatics that have to move lymph and everything it contains within them um, that was derived from the interstitial spaces back to the great the venous circulation. And as Dr. Oxen and everybody went through, it's important for three uh, very important functions. The classic one, fluid macromolecular homeostasis, lipid absorption in the gut, and then perhaps the thing it's really designed to do, in my opinion, that is the trafficking the immune-relevant um, um, agents such as immune cells, antigens, cytokines, and other inflammatory um, uh, disease processes. I'll skip over this one, um, and actually this one, we'll touch on this a bit tomorrow, but let's start here then. To, in order to be able to have a functional lymphatic, you have to grow and maintain the network of lymphatics that connect that interstitial space through the nodes all the way to the great veins of the neck. Um, you then must provide for formation of lymph, as Dr. Oxen just went through, and then once you've got lymph formed, you've got to be able to transform, transport it from those initial capillaries through the network, very, very extensive network and plexus of lymphatic capillaries to the pre-collectors that sort of, that go in essence into the muscularized collectors all the way to the afferent nodes, very uh, collateral, collateral heavy and anastomosing network of uh, pre-lymphatic vessels going, pre-nodal lymphatic vessels going to the node. You get through the node through mechanisms that everyone thinks we know, but frankly, we don't know very well. Uh, you get out of the uh, output of the node into the efferent lymphatics, joining with other efferent lymphatics in an anastomosing network again, eventually going to the thoracic duct and the right lymphatic duct to uh, drain the lower half and left qu quadrant of the body and the right upper quadrant, respectively. Uh, Dr. Raxer went over that, so I'll skip over this a little bit. Um, let's start right here then. So once you've got lymph formed, how do you actually move it? We're starting off with uh, lymph that lymph is formed from initial interstitial fluid, whereas Dr. Roxon alluded to, frankly, in many tissues of the body, body is slightly negative, sometimes slightly positive in compartmentalized organs. Um, you move it into the lymphatics through mechanisms. We have some idea of how they work, but frankly, not completely. Once you get it there, you have to take it from those initial lymphatic capillaries where the pressure is very low, either slightly above or slightly below atmospheric pressure. So it's you know, plus or minus a, a couple centimeters of water at best. And you have to move it all the way up to the great veins of the neck where the pressure is, of course, oscillating with cardiac pulsations with respiration, but on average, it's uh, you know, just under 10 centimeters of water positive. So you've got to move it against its pressure gradient. So the concept that we often, and the phrase that many of us often use, that lymph drains is really a misnomer, because drainage implies that it uses passive gradient forces to, to drive that movement like you do in the sewer system. And in fact, it mostly does not work that way 90% of the body, 90% of the time. It works that way during edematous conditions, because now you've upset this balance of forces and pressures that exist in your body. But otherwise, you have to actually move it uphill. In addition, in, 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 in animals that have a significant vertical height, um, such as humans, you also have to move it literally up against opposing gravitational forces. And so if you look at uh, lymph flow from the foot, you have a, a basically, uh, for an average male, uh, you, about a, you have about 150 centimeter height water pressure to overcome. Now, when you couple that with the fact that lymph pressures are normally, as we already indicated, very, very low 
in the few to tens, few tens of centimeters of water, you add this additional force that you have to overcome, and you see that it can't rely on simple passive drainage, that there has to be other mechanisms. Now, that's not completely true for the upper part of the body when you're standing upright, because there you now have gravitational forces in this compressible, thin, compliant lymphatic vascular system. Even with the valves, it's still influenced by uh, gravitational forces, though they do diminish the overall magnitude here. So how do you do that? In lower vertebrates, there's specialized lymphatic hearts. So reptiles, amphibians have actual distributed lymphatic hearts, many of them through the body. Mammals, including man, do not have that. So what you do is you use the lymphatic pumps and the lymphatic valves to overcome this pressure gradients to drive lymph flow from lower pressure spaces where it begins all the way back through higher positive pressures in the great veins of the neck. These pumps are of two types, extrinsic and intrinsic. Extrinsic is what the, the name we give to pumps like in skeletal muscle, where lymphatics in skeletal muscle, as you contract and relax that skeletal muscle, these compress and decompress the lymphatics, and by doing that, they drive lymph flow by applying compression and decompression forces to those encased lymphatics. The other type, and the type that I'll spend most of the time talking about here today, is the intrinsic pump. Because once you get out of those types of organs, like skeletal muscle, like the heart, like the lung, where these, there are these cyclical periods of high and low pressures that produce compression uh, relaxation cycles, you have to go through part periods of the lymphatic vascular tree or bed that don't have that. And so what does that part of the, the, the system rely on? Because remember, it, it's a one-way net movement uh, of flow from the interstitium to the neck, great veins of the neck. So then it uses intrinsic pumps. The, um, just skipped over that one. So the, uh, the intrinsic pump and the extrinsic pump are the two basic mechanisms that the body uses to impart energy to lymph to get it to overcome these pressure gradients that naturally would oppose lymph flow being centrally directed. A good example of the extrinsic pump, that a little bit of work that we've done on it, is in the diaphragm. So this is a mouse diaphragm. And you're looking, in this case, at the uh, this is the peritoneal surface, and this is the pleural surface of that same mouse diaphragm. And what we've done in each of these, and in these little rectangles, is taking a piece and stained it for one of the lymphatic endothelial cell markers, in this case, live one, showing you what the extensive plexus of the lymphatics look like on the pleural surface of the diaphragm and then on the peritoneal surface of the diaphragm. And you can see that it's a quite extensive plexus, and particularly on the peritoneal side of the diaphragm where you have a, essentially a very wet compartment, if you will. Um, those, that part of this di uh, lymphatic plexus, which is this massive lacunae, or basically lake of lymphatic cap, of the equivalent of a lymphatic capillary, but in this case it's a massive structure, is actually resides within the skeletal muscle portion of the diaphragm. So when your diaphragm contracts and relaxes throughout respiratory movements, it compresses and decompresses these vessels. And in doing so, drives lymph flow essentially two ways, partially centrally, where it goes into the tenderness region of the diaphragm, and then in, in that tenderness region of the diaphragm, you have lymphatics that also have this intrinsic pumping that you'll see in just a minute. And some of them go out to the periphery into the, uh, connect up to the pleural lymphatics lying along the, the, th the thoracic wall. And this is an example of a type of an extrinsic pump. Um, this is a very unique structure that has these very large lacunae. Again, these are lymphatic structures stained within this diaphragm, and you can see the little stomata or openings within them that are thought to be where lymph enters. Um, we're fairly certain that that's what, what's going on there, though, in fact, we don't know exactly how these are formed, and they're not quite so simple as this alludes to. It's not just a big open space within this big red structure, or in this case, it's the same thing stained blue, but in fact, it's a very convoluted path that goes through lots and lots of lymphatic endothelial cells. We believe it does so for the purposes of sampling antigen and looking at what's contained within that lymph to present immune responses if needed to the, uh, uh, the node. We'll skip over this one, that's more of that. And this is an example now of the intrinsic pump. You, Dr. Rockson showed this one. So this is a vessel that's very small, a little, little bit over 100 microns from the rat mesentery, been taken out, isolated, dissected free from the tissue, and then this is cannulated so we can pressurize it. And that's one of the valves there. You can see it, this is normal speed contracting, relaxing to drive lymph flow from areas of uh, low pressure to an area of high pressure downstream. Okay, there we go. If we analyze this, 
we can look at this vessel then as both a conduit, that is a vascular path for lymph to flow down, and a pump or a heart. And we do that by looking at the lymphatic diameter over time, and we can analyze the types of vascular parameters you would in veins or in blood vessels. You can have basal tone, you have compliance of these vessels, and in both cases, basal tone is very, very low in lymphatics, even lower than it is in heart, much, much lower than it is in, in the arterial side, and compliance is very high. But you can also look at this as actually a cardiac analogy, where we look at contraction frequency, ejection fraction, pump flow, all determined by end diastole and end systolic measurements of the diameter and estimations of what the volumes are. And so in that case, the actual lymphatic works as a heart. And you can see here that these are some diameter isol uh, contractions, and they can be pretty extensive or pretty small. The previous ones were very strong. You've seen contractions 50 to 60 percent, very rapid um, in terms of their contraction velocities, uh, fairly slow in terms of their frequencies. They're typically on the order of a few to maybe a few tens of contractions per minute. And then you can also look at those vessels in terms of uh, their ability to generate tone. And you can look at then tonic contraction because they have tone like blood vessels and the phasic contractions. And the unique thing about lymphatics that we'll get to later is those two types of contractions are necessary to drive both the pumping mechanisms to drive lymph flow and the conduit mechanisms to regulate where that flow goes within the lymphatic vasculature. And they all rely and um, they all lie in the unique lymphatic muscle. So what are some of the regulators, the classic regulators of this intrinsic lymph pump? Well, there are intrinsic ones, of which we've spent a lot of my career studying. That is, there are, there are physical hydrodynamic factors. The classic one is stretch. For the last 50 or 60 years, we've known that as you stretch these vessels by increasing the pressure within them, you stimulate them to contract faster, you stimulate them to contract harder, um, up until a point. And at a certain point, they begin to fail, just like the just like the cardiac pump fails. It's just at a much lower pressure than the heart would. They're also sensitive to flow and shear. So as you increase flow within these vessels, you increase the shear rate on those endothelial cells that sense that shear. They release various factors, including some of the classic vasodilators you see in blood vessels and veins, that is nitric oxide, prostanoids, and one unique one, histamine, that then acts on lymphatic muscle to modulate its activity. And generally speaking, when you increase flow, the pump actually slows down. It vasodilates it, and it rests. There are other factors extrinsic to the lymphatics, that is neural factors, because these vessels have adrenergic, cholinergic, and peptidergic innervation, and chemical factors that are circulating through both lymph as well as through the surrounding interstitial fluid that can modulate their pumping activity, all in a matter of, of of changing lymph flow through that particular bed and potentially probably altering their immune activity as well. This is an example of the, the concept of how press, pressure stimulates the vessel. This is the same isolated vessel, again very small, about 100 microns. You can see the tip of the pipette. These are the contraction, uh, real contraction speeds going on at a low pressure. That's how it contracts at a same vessel at a higher pressure, in this case 5 centimeter water, stimulates that vessel to contract faster and harder. If we then go to look at a um, lymphatic vessel, this is a bigger one from the neck, about 300 microns. Um, it's, even though it's one of those vessels that could theoretically use gravitational forces to drive lymph, it still has pumping activity. Um, and in fact, when you impose a flow on them, the, the, the video on the right is actually playing, and you see that that pump essentially stops. Because at this point, you no longer need the pump to drive lymph flow in a vessel. And then every time it contracts, you increase resistance by the fourth power of that radius, and thus you actually slow down flow. So that shear generates in this particular vessel nitric oxide to cause it to vasodilate, shuts down the pacemaker activity that drives this pump, and makes it become a passive conduit uh, like other vessels. This is an example showing you the interaction of these lymphatic muscle cells which are wrapped around the vessel this way. This is a confocal image. You can see the endothelial luminal side flip by and those endothelial cells and muscle cells are very, very closely um, next to each other because the lymphatic vessel is exceptionally thin-walled, even thinner-walled than and then veins. And those interactions allow it to be an effective modulation and control of the pumping and the conduit act activity of the vessel. Okay, I'm going to skip over a little bit of this, but in order to understand some of these principles, 
we had to develop some, some specialized tools that let us study this because, again, this is a field that's greatly, in the basic biology, is greatly uh, poorly understood, understood and understudied. And so one of the things we had to do when we were looking at the effect of shear rate on these vessels and this pump is we've never, no one's ever measured shear rate in them. These are very small vessels, difficult to measure shear rate with. So we took some techniques that have been used in classic microcirculatory uh, analyses, and we applied them in this case to not the red blood cells flowing in a, in a blood vessel, but those white blood cells that you just seen zipping by um, in this lymphatic vessels. We use those as particle tracers, and we track them over time, analyze the velocities, and estimate shear using some fluid dynamic uh, um, calculations that my friends in the biomedical engineering department do. And from that, vet, from those uh, numbers, we can then determine what shear rate is in these vessels. What I will, so this is to let you know, this is is a rat mesenteric vessel like you've seen isolated, but in this case intact in the mesentery, so it's an in situ preparation. Animals asleep, anesthetized, guts exteriorized, and we're microscopically imaging one of these vessels. These are the nutritive blood vessels that serve that lymphatic because it's very, very metabolically active as you can see from its in nature. If you look at the velocity, okay, uh, of those vessels, and I'm going to skip to it right down here over here. So this is a, a tracing showing the diameter over time. Time is on the, on the x-axis. These are the actual velocities. You can see this is the zero line. So in these vessels, flow actually goes backwards for a short period of time to close those valves. Then it propels forward as that vessel diameter contracts and it drives the lymph, the pressures in the right way to open the right valves and close the right valves. These are the shear rates that you see in them. And the shear rates you see are exceptionally low. They're in the order, the average shear rate is approximately a half of a centimeter, dine per centimeter squared, with the peaks of approximately 10 times that value. So it's much lower shear rates than what you see in arterioles, and it's actually even lower than what you see in, in most vein, parts of the venous network. Yet they're incredibly sensitive to shear at this point. Um, I wanted to show you this video. This is a, one of those rat mesenteric lymphatics that's taken out, cannulated, and we load it with cell tracker green, and we confocally image it. And what you're seeing is a three-dimensional reconstruction. In this case, the valves, this, you're on the central end, and the lymph would be squirting out of the screen there, and you can see those are the valves that you could actually see in one of Dr. Roxon's images, these kind of semi-lunar valves. Um, that, that open and close throughout this lymphatic cycle. You'll see we've kind of blurred out the, the vessel wall so you can't see individual cells very well. We did that purposely to show it as a solid structure. And then here's what it looks like as you look down the input end. You can see the valve leaflets and the little nuclear bumps that are where the endothelial cell nuclei are and uh, the open uh, um, lumen of this valve. These valves we now know are very, very effective. It takes only a a centimeter water or less to open and close them. They're biased in the open position, so when there's an equal pressure across them, those, those valve leaflets are slightly open. And we're beginning to understand a little bit more about the biophysics of how these work. We know that in most of these vessels, not all of them, but nitric oxide plays a critical role, just as it does in blood vessels, because it's, it is one of the predominant shear sensitive uh, vasodilators and modulators, of this case not only tone, but also this lymph pump, because nitric oxide shuts down the pacemaker activity, or at least greatly diminishes it, and decreases the strength of the contractions as well. What you have here is up on the top, again, in situ measures with the lymph, lymphatic vessel up here, uh, those are the walls contracting, relaxing. This one has a, um, was not a very good preparation, because it's got red blood cells in it. Um, but we used it purposely here to be able to il illustrate how, what the flow profile looks in situ with its uh, s s nutritive blood vessels around it. Down below, you have an example of one of those where you stain for ENOS to show the, uh, um, the uh, e expression patterns of nitric oxide synthase throughout this vessel that it relies on for a number of factors. Um, we know that nitric oxide is pulsed every time a contraction occurs. The basal levels change dramatically over time, and that there's more of it produced right around this valve, leaflet, and bulb region, partially because there's more enos, partially because of the dynamic nature of the shear within those segments. We know that this mechanism works just like in blood vessels. There's a nitric oxide-dependent, L-name-dependent, 
um, guanylate cyclase dependent pathway that works through cyclic GK, GMP and PKG to modulate lymphatic tone and, and pressure. Um, we're going to skip over some of those details. Let's get into the next part where we're talking about what gives the lymphatic structures this unique ability to generate pumping as well as modulate their flow resistance. Um, and it's basically the lymphatic muscle. The lymphatic muscle you could see in some of those earlier pictures. We'll see you some more. You'll see some more here. Um, the lymphatic muscle is a very unique kind of hybrid. It's a hybrid between a striated muscle and a smooth muscle. So it's thought for many, many decades to be similar to vascular smooth muscle and been described that way for 40, 50 years. And in fact, it has some similar characteristics. It has lots of alpha vascular smooth muscle actin, just like vascular smooth muscle. It has a significant amount of gamma vascular actin. It also has some of the smooth muscle myosin isotypes. It tends to have the faster contractile isotypes, but it has some of those. But those types of contractile proteins appear to give it its ability to generate slow chronic tone that requires very little ATP and energy to constrict. Um, it also have to have, has to have the rapid phasic ability to contract, to generating these pumping motions, because those contractions physically, biophysically, are very different than the slow tonic contraction. For those phasic contractions, the lymphatic muscle or some cell residing within that layer, and we're not 100% certain yet, has electrical pacemaker activity. That is, it's electrically destable, and it will generate action potentials over time. Those action potentials propagate from one cell to another via gap junctions. Um, and then once those action potentials uh, hit their peak, they actually release calcium from internal stores. Actually, what they do first is they open up channels on the membrane, so they have L and T type channel, uh, calcium channel types, that will then allow certain calcium levels to influx. That calcium influx then drives the calcium release from the sarcoplasmic stores, and that calcium release then drives phasic contractile pumping activity. In addition, they have, as already described, the tone generated by the tonic lymphatic muscle contractions. How do, you, how do the vessel and the lymphatic muscle accomplish those dichotomous types of activities? Well, one of the things we know from long ago is that this muscle cell, when you look at the phasic activity, contracts very quickly. So if you compare it, and these are the types of experiments you use to figure out what the contraction velocities are in muscle, in terms of muscle lengths per second. And those characteristics kind of define, uh, are related to whether they use striated or smooth muscle contractile machinery. What we now know is that those lymphatic muscle, which is here, these are, these are measurements done when we activate them with agonists, um, high potassium, substance P, uh, noradrenergic stimulants, you get contraction velocities that are not a lot different than what you see in vascular smooth muscle. And it's, they're, a little, they're in the range of what you see in the phasic or rapid vascular smooth muscle, and higher than what you see in tonic muscle. But when you look at the lymphatic muscle generated contraction velocities generated intrinsically through this electrical activity, you can see it's significantly higher, approximately four to five times higher. And it's now getting in the range of what you see in cardiac contraction velocities, which is unique because cardiac contraction velocities utilize special striated muscle um, to generate those types of velocities. And so the question comes up, is lymphatic muscle regulated by thick? or thin filament mechanisms are both. Um, is it a th thick, smooth muscle type of mechanism that relies pr principally on myosin light chain kinase, myosin light chain phosphate, phosphatase, to modulate the phosphorylation state of myosin light chain interacting with, the act with actin? Or is it a thin striated form like you see in, in skeletal and cardiac that utilizes troponins and tropomyosin to regulate the interaction driven by calcium changes? What we know is that it's actually both. Because if you look at lymphatic muscle, they will have the smooth muscle myosin heavy chain isoforms, again, predominantly the faster ones, but they also have striated ones, like cardiac myosin form, beta myosin heavy chain. Um, they also have actin isoforms of both types within the same smooth muscle. Now, how this is arranged within the smooth muscle, frankly, at this point, we're not sure. We know that they're not separate muscle types where one is a fast contractile, one is a, is a slow tonic contractor, 
they are in fact one muscle type that has heterogeneous contractile proteins within them and regulatory proteins. How they're arranged within that cell is what we're currently trying to determine. We know that they interact with one another because they have a total contractile force, if you will, that they can generate, and it's somehow divided between the phasic contraction and tonic contraction. So if you do things to activate tone, you diminish the ability of that vessel to generate pumping fast phasic activity and vice versa. And in fact, we know now that the nitric oxide that we see generated by lymph flow in these vessels actually serves an important purpose to make tone very, very low, down in the 6% six, 6 tone or so, much lower than even you see in muscularized veins. And so that tone is low because what it does is it allows this vessel to act as a very strong and efficient pump. And in essence, what we've described it as, it's, it gives it enhanced lucitropy, just like you see in the heart. Okay, what drives that phasic muscle contractile characteristics? Well, once we've, the electrical activity, be honest with you, we are still deciphering. And there's not a, there's, we do not have a very good handle. For one thing, we don't know what the pacemaker cells are. We are starting to understand the, the types of channels within the muscle cells that aren't necessarily the pacemakers, but within the muscle cells that drive the calcium oscillations and contractions. But what we do know is that once you've got the action potential, for every action potential and contraction, so this is the contraction you'd see up on the top, you get a preceding calcium spike that precedes that contraction to generate that phasic rapid contraction in the pumping mechanism. You can look at it in a little more detail here. Uh, it relies on external, external calcium because if you remove it, the contractions go away. If you return it, it will come back. And it's sensitive to classical um, L-type channel inhibitors. We now have data to show that the T-type channel um, calcium channels are also important probably in starting this whole process. Um, uh, exactly how that comes about, we're not know. We're we don't know yet. Um, one of the things we know is that we said before, as you stretch the vessels and you, and, you, and you increase the pressure, you stimulate the ability to contract, they contract faster and they contract harder. We know that in part that's due to driving the calcium changes. So if you look here, Here's two graphs that show what the changes in the pressure are, and then what the systolic and diastolic diameter measurements that we make in those vessels. And you can see the corresponding calcium levels. And so basal calcium goes up as you stretch it um, through channels we, are, we don't know yet, but we know they're mechanosensitive and appear to involve at least activation through um, a stretch sensitive channel, perhaps a trip channel, that, that data is rather preliminary now, and then they release this calcium stores from the SR to generate this peak calcium and then drive that phase that contract all activity. Uh, we'll skip over that, and I, I, at this point what I'd just like to do is uh, I acknowledge the folks that did this, because this is a compilation, probably about 15, 20 years of work done by various groups within our department, outside of the department. Um, and Dr. Goshev and Mutha Chami were clear, uh, important collaborators within our divisional lymphatic biology, understanding the different contractile activities and the types of muscle activities within the contractions, and also how those activities are regulated by um, various physical activities, and then uh, stretch and, and flow. The rest of them are all folks that have worked with either at A&M or other institutions. 